We're going to go ahead and get started here. So thank you all for coming. I'm Suzanne Wons, the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all for coming to today's discussion of Professor Cass Sunstein's forthcoming book, The World According to Star Wars. And I'd also like to thank the New England Garrison and Alderaan base of the 501st and Rebel Legions for joining us today. It's great fun to have you guys here, too. Uh, and I do want to let you know that today's uh, session is being taped, so uh, if you ask any questions at the end, they'll be part of that recording. Uh, and we're also raffling off some movie tickets today, so if you want to enter the raffle, there's a glass bowl in the back. You can put the slips which are on the table there. There's also more slips at the back if you don't have enough at your table. And uh, the winners will be contacted by email. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Cass Sunstein. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for coming in this extremely historic month. Did you hear the force is going to awaken in a few weeks? Yeah, yeah, it's so. Okay, so uh, here's my epigraph. This is a real dialogue between the astounding Lawrence Kasdan, co-author of Emperor Strikes Back, and the uh, force uh, blessed George Lucas. Uh, they're discussing Return of the Jedi, and Kasdan is saying, somebody should die. Luke should die. Han should die. Kazan said, the movie has more emotional weight if someone you love is lost along the way. The journey has more impact. Lucas, I don't like that, and I don't believe that. I think that's a precious response. Uh, the sequence is precious. I don't like that, and I don't believe that. Motivated, yes, he hates the idea that someone you love is going to die, and so he doesn't believe it. That's perfect. OK, so a law professor on Star Wars, this is kind of unusual. I'm working today both on a very technical administrative law question that maybe six people, maybe four, will be interested in, and Star Wars. So I'm going to tell you the actual uh, genesis of this. So since I was uh, quite young, I've been obsessed with Star Wars. It's just true. It's been a lifelong obsession. Uh, I was a political science major in college, and it was only because of my Star Wars focus with, you know, you saw those movies and you had to focus on political science. And I, I, I thought about going to graduate school, but given the arc of Star Wars where uh, the rule of law seems absent from the life under the emperor, that's why I went to law school. Uh, after law school, I thought, what am I going to do? And my dream was to try to find someone who could be like Obi-Wan and to work for that person, to apprentice myself in that way, uh, to be a Padawan. And the only possibility was Justice Thurgood Marshall. He was uh, a Skywalker, if there ever was one, fighting for civil rights and justice. And, uh, you know, I was a little, I didn't tell many friends, but the friends I told thought it was quite peculiar, that that's why I wanted to clerk for Justice Marshall. Uh, but I kept thinking, that's, that's what I want, and I got lucky. After that, I had an offer from a law firm that was pretty lucrative, and you know, young uh, lawyers st starting out, like many of you, if you can start with a law firm that'll pay you a good salary, that's good. It came with an inch of taking it, but the words kept going through in my mind, I want to come with you to Alderaan. That's what Luke said. So I went to work for the Department of Justice. Uh, my early work, my academic work that got me tenure is not coincidentally about the Republican revival. You can look it up. It's about civic virtue. And of course, when communism fell, my immediate association was uh, the emperor fell. The rebels did it. And so at the University of Chicago, we started a center on the fallout. OK, so uh, I've been interested in behavioral science now for uh, a number of years. And I'll tell you the real story of why I got interested. Uh, some people got interested because they saw problems in neoclassical economics. For me, it was stormtroopers. Uh, they, uh, they, they go into fire, they make choices that don't seem fully rational. I was <laughs> completely puzzled about that. So that got me intrigued by behavioral science. Uh, when I worked in the Obama administration, of course, I thought uh, all the time. Uh, uh, 
you know, what would Jedi do? And uh, I didn't tell my colleagues in the White House this, but it's completely motivated by Luke Skywalker. Freedom and free trade were the, the watchwords for me. My first girlfriend looked exactly like Carrie Fisher. <laughs> I called her Carrie, though that wasn't her name. Maybe that's why we broke up. So the project uh, you're hearing about is, is Destiny. OK, what I just told you isn't even a little bit true. <laughs> it's all made up. <laughs> I like Star Wars plenty, but it had zero impact on my career. I, I didn't think, I'm sorry, I didn't, think, I didn't think about it once. The Republican revival, that is early articles, completely coincidence. The interest in behavioral economics had nothing to do with st st uh, stormtroopers, sorry. Yeah, here's the real story. Uh, that's my son. His name is Declan. Um, I was at a dinner party a few months ago, and a friend at the end of the party just pointed to A New Hope and said, you ought to show your boy uh, the movie. And I thought, that's a terrible idea. There's only one thing he likes, and you're watching it, baseball. He really loves baseball. Uh, but on a lark, and so as not to be rude, I took the move, the little CD, and I thought, having taken the CD, the person's a friend, I kind of have to show it to my little boy. And he fell for the, for the movie. He completely loved it. And ended up um, becoming a big Star Wars fan. That's the source of this project. I'm telling you this not just because uh, it's kind of fun to say something ridiculous and false like Star Wars determined everything, but because this is my take on Star Wars, that destiny is the nominal theme of the movie, prophecy and destiny, but the actual theme is about serendipity and freedom of choice. That's what the series is about. Okay, so today this franchise has earned more than $20 billion. Uh, this is gonna get a lot bigger soon. That exceeds the GDP of dozens of nations of the world. So if Star Wars were a nation and its earnings were at the GDP, were GDP, it would be below the middle of the world's nations, but not wildly below. So it should probably have a seat at the United Nations, don't you think? OK, theme one, uh, how does creativity actually work? So this is connected with the theme about freedom of choice and serendipity. Here's the great George Lucas. Uh, you have to remember that originally Star Wars it was intended to be one movie, episode four of a serial. You never saw what came before or what came after. It was designed to be the tragedy of Darth Vader. Uh, that's Lucas's account of the genesis of the series. Uh, here's more. It starts with this monster coming through the door, throwing everybody around, and then halfway through the movie you realize that the villain of the piece is actually a man and the hero is his son. And the villain turns out into the hero inspired by the son. It was meant to be one movie, but I broke it up because I didn't have the money to do it like that. It would have been five hours long. So there's the woe, I am your father, which on the previous accounts he had uh, figured out. Okay, not really. That's not true. There's a widely held view that Lucas wrote it all out in something called the Journal of the Wills. The Journal of the Wills does exist. It's a very short fragment. It has nothing like the arc of the series. What actually happened was that when A New Hope was written, uh, there was no sense that Darth Vader was the dad. Uh, the sense was that there was a separate guy who was the dad who had been killed by Darth Vader, just as Obi-Wan says in the movie. And uh, late, uh, Lucas thought in the writing of uh, episode five, uh, maybe it would be really interesting and cool if Darth Vader turns out to be the father. So you can get a clue about the truth of the tale in what uh, Lucas said in an interview shortly after A New Hope came out. He said he had mine a sequel, and uh, pause if you would over these words, about Ben and Luke's father and Vader, three people, not two, when they are young Jedi Knights. But Vader kills Luke's father. Then Ben and Vader have a confrontation, just like they have in Star Wars, and Ben almost kills Vader. 
that's kind of contemporaneous with the release of the movie. And it gives away the fact that the narrative arc had not been established. I think this is extremely interesting because it's about how creativity works in art, it's about how law works, and it's about how human life works. Here's uh, my favorite. Luke, the TV show Lost, which is the greatest thing since Star Wars. Uh, Lucas wrote a letter to the authors of Lost and said, in something that's been posted, don't tell anyone, but when Star Wars first came out, I didn't know where it was going either. The, the trick is to pretend you've planned the whole thing out in advance. That's the trick, all right. OK, yuck. Uh, <laughs> their uh, brother and sister are, that's kind of a little much for brother and sister. Uh, so Luke and Leia, brother and sister, that was a late innovation also. Um, Mark Hamill said this was just a lame attempt to top the Darth is his father thing which isn't uh, a little harsh, not quite lame, but uh, it suggests a serendipitous kind of solution to a problem, which is Yoda says in five, are you surprised I know all this stuff? Yoda says, if you don't, there's some time to study before December 18th, but Yoda says there is another in five, and then who's the other? Who is the other? Luke, Lucas had to solve that, and this is how he solved that. That's a cheek kiss, contrary to appearances. It's more chaste than it appears. OK, so episode seven poses a challenge for Abrams, who's a little bit in the position of Lucas writing episode five and six and one, two, three. He's continuing the sequence. And there's a question about how exactly to do that. Now, one way to do it would be to say episode six was just a dream, and everybody's still alive, and this was Luke's fantasy. That would be terrible, right? We'd all hate that. Another would be to say that Emperor was actually Yoda pretending to be the Emperor, and it was Luke's final test, and he screwed it up by almost killing his dad. That, uh, that would be, no one would want to see that, right? Uh, Leia and Han divorce because she can't get over her romantic attraction to Luke. That would be the worst of all. Uh, Luke goes to the dark side. That is a rumored. Um, plot line, I think that's extremely interesting. It would have one of the same features as um, episode five's twist, Darth as the Father has, in the sense that it's continuous with everything you've seen, but it twists it in a really intriguing way. We'll see if that, ha if that happens. Ronald Dworkin's conception of interpretation in art and uh, law is highly relevant here. He says what you have to do is fit and justify the proceeding. You have to fit it, meaning it can't be a random departure from what happened before. The first, it's just a dream, is pretty close to a failure of fit. It kind of works, but it's uh, uh, too much of a charade. Uh, these three proposals, all they make, the, they make the whole series stupid, every single one of these, so they don't justify it even if they fit. This conception of fit and justification, I think it has a lot to do with how narrative creation works. It's how we think about history often. Uh, Martin Luther King was a, uh, a narrative author in a way. And though he was a rebel, he was a rebel of the Luke Skywalker sort. That is meaning a backward looking rebel rather than a trash everything rebel. So King said, if we're wrong, then the Constitution of the United States is wrong, which framed the civil rights movement as a restoration rather than a casting off. And interestingly, Luke is a restorer, isn't he? OK, more themes. Here we go quickly. Uh, Kessel Run, not many parsecs. If you don't get that reference, I feel really sorry for you. OK, so uh, what's the source of success of Star Wars? How did it do so spectacularly well? One hypothesis is it's too awesome not to. <laughs> a, a second is there are social influences, which would say a shorthand that Star Wars is a little like July 4th, meaning it's a national celebration now, and it became that in a hurry. And a third is to say it fit with the uh, temper of the times, the zeitgeist. OK, I don't know if you saw this movie, uh, Searching for Sugar Man. 
or if you know who that is, uh, that's a guy named Sisto Rodriguez, who is, uh, with the partial exception of this quite recent movie, is a failed rock singer who is a demolition man in Detroit. Uh, he released two albums in the 70s. Uh, they tanked, and he became a nobody. While he was a nobody, notwithstanding his promise, he was, unbeknownst to himself, an astonishing success in South, South Africa. He was like Star Wars in South Africa. Bigger than the Beatles, bigger than the Rolling Stones, uh, bigger than Dylan, so much so that people in South Africa would use the word Rodriguez with a kind of awe and reverence that we rarely see for anything. What happened? Why was he such a success in South Africa and such a failure in the United States? Okay, Harry Potter was turned down by a bunch of presses uh, who thought it had no, no promise. Uh, its initial advance was really low. Someone took a flyer on it. No one had expectations that it would take off in the way it did. Why is that? Failure of predictability for Rodriguez in South Africa and for Harry Potter. I don't know if I, how many people here have read the um, Robert Gottlieb, at least one of the Robert Gottlieb series written by uh, J.R. Rowling. I'm the only one. OK, uh, they're great. They're fantastic. The fact that you haven't read it and apparently not heard of it is, is interesting data. When the Gottlieb book first came out, people reviewed it well, and it sold disastrously. Then people heard it was Rowling's book, and it ended up doing actually extremely well. You can find it in, in airports. OK, Star Wars. Uh, throughout its production, there was apathy toward the project with Fox. And executives generally had little faith in the film or its director. They hoped a lot of times that it would just go away. This is astounding, yes? We're talking about a major studio, Fox. Fox hoped for advance guarantees from theaters of $10 million. That's not good. They only got a fraction of that, $1.5 million. Immediately after A New Hope opened, Lucas and his wife went on vacation in Hawaii. They wanted to be far, far away, not just because they needed a vacation, but because they feared Lucas had released a flop. In Hawaii, they could escape what Lucas was himself certain was going to be a disaster. OK, what happened here? Here's a possible hypothesis. This is the social influence hypothesis. It's from a study involving something called the Music Lab, where it turns out that if people hear songs that have been downloaded by few other people, they don't download the songs. So suppose you go on a website a new website, let's call it the Star Wars musical website. We're inventing it right now. And it has 28 songs. Uh, you see my name as the singer in several of the songs, and you think that uh, probably not. <laughs> you, you, you see um, Selena Gomez in the singer, as the singer in some, and some of you will think that maybe that's interesting. Uh, and then probably if the assortment works out right, there's going to be a rank order. Now assume that you see how many people have downloaded various songs, and you see Selena Gomez, everybody's downloaded hers. And now suppose some of you see everyone's downloaded my song, improbably. The finding of the Music Lab experiment is that songs that can tank when people see that no one's downloaded them can be tremendous successes if people see lots of people have downloaded them which is a suggestion that the reason Rodriguez did well in South Africa is probably that he was like, uh, he caught an early wave, serendipitously. Early people really liked him. They talked to each other, and then it went viral. The idea is that's what happened with Harry Potter, and that's what happened with Star Wars, which isn't to diminish the amazingness on this theory of any of these things. It's to suggest that there are Rowlings and Rodriguez's, Rodriguez in America is one, and Star Wars Lucas types that we've never seen because they never caught an early wave. That's the theory. That cultural success is often a product of serendipitous factors involving what catches on at a crucial moment. 
Okay, there's another theory, which is that the reason Star Wars took off had nothing to do with social influences. It had to do with the culture at the time. Uh, after Vietnam, after Nixon, the culture needed a kind of lift, something very positive, and this uh, gave that. Okay, uh, a mixed verdict, I think, is the right one. Uh, social influences really mattered. Star Wars this month and Star Wars shortly after it initially came out was a kind of focal point for network effects. People wanted to see it because other people were seeing it. They didn't want to be people who didn't see what other people were seeing. Um, network effects, it did fit with the zeitgeist. I don't think it needed it, but maybe it's just too good. Okay, there's uh, the first scene where, I don't know if you can see it, I saw it in the theater at the time, if you could see it with fresh eyes. But as you see the ship, and it goes on and on and on, it's so big and you're under it. Audiences at the time rose in applause and didn't stop cheering until the movie was over. It's electrifying. So this is a kind of, I like that and I believe that point in favor of saying awesomeness is in the end the right theory, <laughs> though I'm not sure it's true. Okay, constitutional law. <laughs> um, some people think that uh, the Constitution is like the Journal of the Wills. It's all written down. And that either constitutional should be, law should be, and sad that it isn't, or it turns out that it actually is an unspooling of the original journal. I'll tell you how I made the Star Wars constitutional law connection in my own head. Uh, it's just true that the constitutional protection of commercial speech, which is now regarded, I think, as a kind of inevitable and um, you know, fixed aspect of contemporary constitutional law, you know, an ad is protected presumptively by the First Amendment. So if some horrible person tried to censor an ad for The Force Awakens, that's unimaginable to be sure, it would also be a violation of the First Amendment. And that's kind of a fixed point. Um, the, the existence of constitutional protection of constitutional speech stemming from the 1970s is actually an I am your father moment. That is, it's a switch that the court pulled on longstanding doctrine that constitutionalized commercial speech as a free speech entity in the face of previous practices and some decisions that had gone hard the other way. So it just is an I am your father moment. Now, that fact made yours truly think there's something to be written on the I am your fatherness of the protection of commercial advertising. But an investigation of First Amendment history suggests there'd be something really myopic and narrow about that paper. Guess when political speech got protected by a clear, firm, and a clear, a firm, clear and present danger test? Guess when that happened? The 1960s, the late 1960s which suggests that the First Amendment actually is, doesn't have what might be thought of as a barnacle or an I am your father moment, the, the commercial speech protection, but it's there all the way. It's free speech as I am your father pervaded. Political speech, its protection is a, an artifact of a case called Brandenburg against Ohio, as you know, that's what got the strong protection of commercial speech in the system, which we now take as sacrosanct. That was a, a continuation of the narrative that was not Luke, Leia's in love with Luke, she has to leave, ugh, oh man, but instead, wow, continuous and improving. The protection of sex against sex discrimination, the protection against race discrimination, most obviously, the kind of extraordinarily unanticipated breakout of the right to same-sex marriage in circumstances in which very recently that would have seen, seen like, a, I think, 
like a bizarre episode seven. Now it's taken as a terrific and inevitable episode seven. That's what constitutional law is like. What the court is doing this term in the affirmative action and abortion controversies is it's continuing the narrative. It's doing what J.J. Abrams has to do. I think he has very little time in which to do anything new, but he's doing these days, which is perfecting the continuation of the tale. It has to fit with the tale and it has to make it good. We may see, you know, in, in the abortion case or affirmative action case, something like what many people will see as an I am your father moment. That is, that's great and it uh, sends a shiver down the spine, a click of correctness. Or it might seem to some, probably the room would be divided on this, as a kind of I am Captain Kirk moment. Oh no, they did that? Okay, so constitutional law on that view is like a, a chain. It has a bunch of links, and the new link has to be kind of firmly tethered to the old, but also kind of make it look continuous. That's what constitutional law is like. It's what narrative construction is like. Um, I was with uh, an author uh, of things unlike what I write. I write law review articles until this. Um, uh, an author, and I said to Tim, when you write things, and he's written some fiction too, um, do, uh, do you know what you're doing in advance? And he said, no clue, even with short things. He says, the characters end up taking over and take things in a direction. They have their own autonomy. George Lucas said exactly the same thing at one point. The characters take over. Now, if you're writing a brief in law, sometimes it's a little like that, where the argument takes over and what you sit, plan to sit down to write isn't what you end up doing. Okay, I think this is a pervasive point about narrative construction. When we th say our history is about this, given how things are in 2016, that's a result of narrative construction. There's a ridiculous movie about, uh, I think it's called The Winds of War, about Pearl Harbor uh, from about 20 years ago, maybe. And there's a moment, uh, it shows the events of Pearl Har Harbor, and after the bombing, right after the bombing, like an hour after the bombing, one character says to another, what happened? And the other character says, Pearl Harbor happened. Do you see why that's ridiculous? There was no Pearl Harbor. Once you're in the middle of a narrative, you don't know what its themes are. You're in it. No one would say a mo an hour after 9-11, 9-11 happened. That would have been a crazy statement. That was the date. Pearl Harbor was the place. The happeningness of Pearl Harbor is an exposed construction of historians who give the narrative a shape. And Pearl Harbor's the, are you with me? Pearl Harbor's the title of the moment. But it isn't when you're in the middle of it. You need to do something like this to create a narrative. OK, unpredictable rebellions. Um, there's one. This is about the fall of communism. Uh, Luke, have you all memorized these? Do you need to look at the screen? Uh, Obi-Wan, you must learn the ways of the force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Alderaan, I'm not going to Alderaan. I've got to get home. It's late. I'm in, in for it as it is. How many potential rebels have answered something like that? <laughs> Obi-Wan, I need your help, Luke. She needs your help. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. Look, I can't get, in, get involved. I've got to, work to do. It's not that I like the empire. Briar, I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. It's all such a long way from here. What's fantastic about that is there would be rebels all over the world in ways small and large that give every single one don't, don't they, of these answers. OK, uh, what's going on there? Why do re rebellions get started, and when do they, uh, uh, when do they get started? Okay, here are uh, two ideas. Idea number one is uh, you have a bunch of people, and you can think of this in small things in your own lives, right? the interaction with a friend who's misbehaving maybe, or with an institution that you're not thrilled with. Or you can think about this as they're leaving, they're upset. <laughs> they don't like their, Pod Padme has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, here, here are the, um, uh, the dynamics of cascades. There are some people like Princess Leia. I'm hoping that this metaphor is going to work for you. Some people who are like Princess Leia, they are just going to lead a rebellion no matter what. They're, they're, they're going to go for it. There are some people like Luke who, who will do it only if there are certain people, only if they're sufficiently enraged that someone killed their aunt and uncle, or only if there's a certain number of predecessors who've gone to, such that they feel uh, motivated in a way that overcomes their resistance. And in the novel version of A New Hope, that is more clear than in the movie. There's a guy named Biggs who makes a very tiny appearance in the movie. Biggs is Luke's kind of big brother in a way, so Biggs is a uh, chosen name, uh, who joins the rebellion. He's more like Leia. And Luke gets motivated a little bit like, like him. Then there are people like Han Solo who will go, if there's a Leia and a Luke, will join, uh, especially if he's in love with Leia, but not, that's not necessarily a precondition. Uh, and then there are people who are a little more uh, distant than the Luke, but who will join if Leia and Luke and Han are all in it. And then there are finally the Sith, who are just going to fight no matter what. And the way the, the rebellions work weighs large and small in that we've seen on the political right and the political left in the recent past is the Leia's go first. If they can get the Luke's going, then the Han's will go too. And if the Luke's and the Leia's and the Han's will go, then that another group will go. And then all you'll have is the Sith remaining. As everyone knows, there's a rule of two, only two. So they're in, in big trouble. Okay, I think that's the dynamics of, of political revolutions. And actually, the first six movies depict uh, both cascade effects giving rise to the rebellion and cascade effects created adroitly by Emperor Palpatine, who manipulates the system so as to create an anti-republic um, uh, uh, anti rebellion. Okay, but there's something that's missing in that story which is that there are a lot of people who falsify their preferences. So it was said after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, a month ago, no one would say a bad word about communism. Now no one's going to say a good word about communism. What's that about? And the theory is that what's, what that is about is that um, there are severe social sanctions against criticizing communism before the fall of communism. After the fall of communism, there were severe social sanctions against saying anything in favor of communism. Not that many people had anything favorable to say, but some did. And that meant that the distribution of opinions under an authoritarian regime, and sometimes in a democratic regime, is very hard to uncover because people won't say what they really think. And once the social pressure starts to be removed, then you have people who are like the Lukes and the Hans, who will end up saying something differently from what they have been explicitly saying. And then you have the conditions ripe for something very dramatic to happen. Now that suggests that rebel successful re rebellions are essentially unpredictable. That they're unpredictable because under conditions of tyrannical rule, you don't really know what people think. And once things start to happen, then you can have a rapid movement of unraveling as the social pressures change. OK, uh, that's Darth Vader. This is the second to biggest theme of Star Wars, I think. Uh, that's a really dark mirror. Can't see it. That's Anakin looking mad. <laughs> OK, so here's what uh, Lucas said at one point about uh, the, the prequels. Anakin says yes, Luke says no. And the much criticized prequels have, I think, a quite brilliant feature, which is that the turning moment for Anakin in episode three is extraordinarily close to the almost turning moment for Luke in episode six. They are mirroring each other almost precisely so much so that Luke is uh, 
is posed with the same dilemmas and questions that Anakin was before. Okay, Yoda, I, th I fear this is in the novel. Darth is speaking to us right now. Uh, th this, this, this is in the, the novel. I think it's in the movie too, I hope so. At one point, uh, Yoda says very pointedly, chose this, Anakin did. Chose this, Anakin did. And chose is in italics to emphasize the importance of exercise of freedom of choice. Okay, why does that happen? That's a good question. Why does Anakin make a choice, say yes, that uh, Luke doesn't? I think there are two possibilities. The less interesting is that Anakin is essentially more damaged, lost his mother uh, early, was taken away as a little child from a family situation. The more interesting is that Anakin faces a more searing loss, right? That Anakin faces the loss of um, uh, his beloved, who'll die otherwise. And what's promised by the emperor is eternal life, that's actually, I think, even more interesting than it seems in the sense that one of the things that episode six, I think, is about is, and five and six together is the acceptance of death, which Yoda promotes, and the rage against death, which the emperor promotes. That's, that's kind of interesting. Okay, here's a disagreement. The emperor, the Sith Lord, thinks that life's trajectory is foreordained Everything is happening as I have foreseen. Yoda, Jedi Master, says, always in motion is the future. <laughs> Who's right? OK. Uh, serendipity and agency. This is, I think, what the series is most deeply about. Uh, George Lucas grew up in Modesto, California. His father, apparently a stern figure, was a uh, successful operator of a stationery store. He wanted his son to take over the business. That's not quite the dark side, uh, <laughs> but it is come with me. And Lucas determinedly went into filmmaking. By the way, there was a serendipitous conversation Lucas had with a friend that got him to go to USC Film School, where the friend said, you can study photography there. It's going to be great where Lucas had a different plan in mind. Uh, without that, who knows whether we'd have the movies. Uh, here's the real meaning of Star Wars. Uh, by their innocence and uh, goodness, and I think most crucially, capacity for, give for forgiveness, that's what Luke has, and by the power of their faith and hope, children redeem their parents, uh, bringing out their best selves. I'm hoping that each of you is flashing right now to some moment where that's actually happened. If you're not aware of it, uh, God's truth, your parents are. Okay, and so one theme, children bring out their parents' best selves. I'm not gonna put up my picture of my little boy because I might cry. Uh, every child wishes and hopes any parent is likely to risk his life to save his child, even if there's a contest with the emperor personally. When he does, guess what's gonna be with that parent? Thus, tell your sister you were right about me, the defining moment in Return of the Jedi. Now, one thing noteworthy about that is George Lucas kind of famously is not great at dialogue. He's a visual genius, but he's not great at dialogue. Harrison Ford said to him, George, you can write that shit, but you can't say it. <laughs> Nonetheless, in this scene, Lucas really delivered. Okay, let's maybe say a little bit more about this. Uh, here's one thing that he delivered on, and the six, the episode three going back at episode six makes it even more clear. The nominal theme of the movies is partly about destiny and the power of prophecy, where the secret theme is about serendipity and freedom of choice. The nominal theme of the movie number two is about serenity and detachment, where Yoda famously says, you know, uh, fear leads to hate, hate leads to, I don't have it exactly right, 
hate leads to the dark side. And fear is clearly described as a, a product of fear of loss. It's about attachment. Anakin turns to the dark side because he can't stand to lose his beloved. And it starts when he loses his mother. Okay? So the nominal theme which the wise people in the movie say is attachment is bad. There's a big Stoic Buddhist theme, I think, in all six of the movies. But the sub-theme, the counterpoint which triumphs, is exactly the opposite. That Anakin is redeemed by exactly the thing that leads him to the dark side. He can't bear to lose his son. The same thing that causes him to embrace the emperor, which fear of loss of his beloved causes him to kill the emperor in the end. That's where redemption comes. He says, tell your sister you were right about me. It's about attachment being the source both of the dark side and the lightest of the light. So here's Loris Kasdan very recently, this is with, I think a week ago, being interviewed uh, about Star Wars. And here's what he says, it's the biggest adventure you can have making up your own life and it's true for everybody. It's infinite possibility. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next five minutes but I can get through it, it's an assertion of a life force. What's the force? That's it. I like that, and I believe it. But you all get the last words. Over to you. Thanks. I should say this is a book very much in progress, uh, so help. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me was when you talked about Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement as being a backwards-facing rebellion. And it made me think that, to a certain extent, all of the rebellions that have been successful in American history have been backwards-facing, from the women's suffrage movement to abolition to even the American Revolution. Um, where we looked back on things that were done in England and in ancient Rome, um, but that sometimes the things that were picked up on, specifically in civil rights and women's suffrage, like the preamble of the Constitution, were not necessarily the things people in the past thought were important. I was wondering if you think that all revolutions that are successful are backwards-facing revolutions, and if you think that's because if you think that if the narrative we're given of the past is what makes that difference or if you disagree with that interpretation. I feel I don't have a sufficient grasp of the history of revolutions to have an answer to that. Um, it's a fantastic question. So if you look at the French Revolution, was that backward looking? Burke's criticism of the French Revolution was that it uh, dispensed with an inheritance and that it unmoored France from its, um, from its traditions and that that's extremely dangerous. So Burke's view is a successful revolution in the long term has to have roots in something. Now, the French Revolution did occur. So if, the Burke, uh, if Burke's account is right, it would be a counterexample. And the American Revolution is kind of complicated on this count. Federalist number one starts by saying we're creating a government that has no, history, no uh, precedence in the history of the world. That is a, uh, not a revolutionary moment, it's a constitution-making moment, and you're right, it had some backward-looking features. I think all I'd feel comfortable in saying is that uh, many of the most resonant revolutions uh, explicitly call on uh, past practices rather than saying they're all garbage. Is that, that creates a, a kind of sentimental attachment to the, 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 rev, the forces of the revolution. I think Martin Luther King was sincere, so it wasn't merely strategic, but there's little question that he also knew exactly what he was doing. So my old boss Thurgood Marshall, after Brown against Board of Education, said, aren't you looking for too much too fast, asking to get rid of segregation? 
And Marshall, Marshall said the Emancipro Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed X number of decades ago. I'm a gradualist. That's a great line. And it did have a backward looking character. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, a few months after 9 11, uh, I remember CNN had this graphic that showed this uh, American carrier group steaming towards the Middle East with the caption, America Strikes Back. And it, it seemed reminiscent of obviously the, the images of the ships in the early movies and the, the obvious title of the, of the fifth, seventh, sixth film or fifth. Also, when Luke has to slide op you know, slit open the Tauntaun and crawl inside to get away from this. You know, remote device that's chasing him. It seems very similar to the drones that we're using now over there. And I wondered if you, what your thoughts were, were as far as others framing the U.S. in terms of being the empire. Well, I'm a patriot, so I think we are, you know, skywalkers as a nation. That's just my own view. Um, it is true that Lucas's own conception uh, is very complicated. And there is an account which seems to connect with his own uh, self-conscious intentions uh, or in the early days where the United States was, go was at risk of going in directions that reflected uh, the dark side. So there's no question that his explicit intention, at least at some stages, was a kind of warning. But I think any account of who's the empire and who's uh, the republic, uh, it will be a little like writing episode seven. It will be you know, one's own constructive interpretation. Uh, Lucas said something, I think this was also recent, um, where after, maybe it was after episode six, he was in front of a bunch of journalists. And he said the Russian journalists thought it was all about Russia. And the American journalists thought it was about the Bush administration. And he said, no, it's about Rome and France. Now, so I think it, it depends on one's own conception, really, of what you think. Uh, I would not want to identify the uh, United States of America with anything other than the Republic. But there's no question that the dark side is something, a risk that even the freest nations have to try to avoid. Um, so my question is that the prequels have been often criticized for sort of the political, all the political machinations that go on. And I'm curious what you think of the emperor's sort of complicated plan to, to bring about what he wants and whether you think there's any historical parallels to what he's trying to do. It's really complicated, right? What the, I'm not sure I fully understand that, what the emperor tried to do about, uh, just, I think he wanted to distract the Jedi to get them all around all separate so he could kill them. That, that emerges from the novelization of episode six. Are you shocked and kind of disturbed that I actually have read the, that? Uh, uh, I, I think, f at least in the nations with which I'm familiar, it's really hard to do those machinations because there are too many checks and balances and there's a free press. So uh, Amartya Sen, the great Harvard economist, has a finding that no nation in the history of the world with free, free press and uh, democratic elections has ever experienced a famine. That's a startling finding. But the, the mechanism is, if you are in a country that has a free press and democratic elections, you're going to work like, uh, like a Jedi to make sure you don't have mass starvation, because you're going to lose your own power. And in an authoritarian nation, you don't have both the sunlight of a free press and you don't have the incentive, the democratic election thing. So uh, I would bring Sen's idea to bear on the machinations point. That level of complexity, it's, it's very hard to carry off. Now, maybe some nations, you can take your pick, that lack freedom are, are vulnerable to that. And the House of, on House of Cards, Kevin Spacey, he, 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 he does it. He does that stuff. Uh, really extremely difficult to do so long as there's uh, at least even a degree of accountability, even international accountability. In other words, that was a long time ago in a galaxy, blah, 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 blah. <laughs>
Um, you've identified choice as one of the one of the main themes. I think we see in episode three and episode six the dark side is clearly identified with obedience. Um, so if the light side is about choice, what do you see it as a choice between? What's the common theme about the okay, choices? Well, that's completely great, what you just said. So you're, that's fantastic. So you're right, that the, uh, and super helpful, that the defining creed of the Sith regime is obedience. And uh, Obi-Wan says to Luke at a crucial moment early in A New Hope, when Luke says the stuff you read, he said, you must do what you think is right. Now that's kind of a nudge, you must do what you think is right, not you must do what you wish, but it's up to you. And Padme says at a crucial time, uh, you, know, you have to choose, you have to choose. And so the Republic is a Republic of choice, you can say that's portrayed very much. The empire is portrayed as one of obedience, that's completely great. And that does fortify my little claim here, which is that uh, uh, movies that are nominally about prophecy are really about anything but. Uh, so there's that. The, the only thing I'd add is that whether to go to the dark side is itself a choice. And I think the movies at their best make that a legitimately hard choice, not just because going to the dark side is potentially a way of saving someone you care about, but also because the dark side has uh, allure. Uh, that's good. Uh, William Blake writing about Milton, who wrote arguably the greatest religious pro poem in the English language, Paradise Lost, said the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he spoke of heaven and uh, I don't have it exactly, but freely when he spoke of Satan is that he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. That's great. Uh, Blake also said, better to, to, to uh, sooner murder, sooner strangle an infant in its cradle than to nurse unacted desires. That's great. That's, it's a proverb of hell, and it's about the, the, the dark side. And what Blake got at in the proverbs and what he said controversially Milton was about was the immense seductive appeal of the dark side. And what Lucas has said uh, in interviews and what the books are clear about in the movies is that the dark side is about going internal, knowing about your own desires and wishes and claims, whereas the light side is about going external. Now, no human being finds that choice to go external easy. And so the choice between the dark side and the light side, I think Lucas is basically a really earnest good person. So it's not as complicated as Blake makes it and as Blake's Milton makes it. But so it isn't like it's a really, really hard choice. You know what the good person does, rejects the dark side. But, but at the best moments, the seductive appeal of the dark side it's there. And there's a great moment in the novelization of um, Return of the Jedi where when Luke is fighting back against Darth Vader, uh, the, the novelist says, and the dark side was very much with him. That's in the movie, but it's, it's not unambiguous. I, I like the fact that it's unambiguous, that he does, the, the, the fact that he can defeat Darth Vader the dark side is with him. So the choice to go one way or the other, that's yours. But once you're in the dark side, in the movies, uh, yes, Mr. Emperor. Yes, sir. Got one. I guess really I'll just respond to something which you suppose make a point about obedience, but I'm not sure it's entirely accurate. And I think back to the prequels where Anakin kind of set himself down the path to the dark side by disobeying Obi-Wan. You know, in episode two, you see him being a renegade. In episode two, he goes to kill the Sand People when he's supposed to be under, er, under Obi-Wan's order watching Padme on Naboo. And you know, Luke's disobedience or threatened disobedience in the beginning of episode four is, could have un, unhinged the entire rebellion. 
And so I'm not, I'm not sure. There are themes that can be found on both sides, I think, and obedience is one of them. And excellent. No, I love that. Thank you. That's excellent. And it me means, so Lucas, though he's an earnest good guy, he has a rebel heart, doesn't he? And, and if he didn't, the movies would just be sanctimonious. And so when Luke is kind of a rebel, though Mark Hamill plays him as a gee whiz kid, he needs to be kind of a rebel. And though the, the Anakin actor, whose name I'm blocking right now, even though he was really good as Stephen Glass in the New Republic movie, no one saw, but he was really good. The guy can act. He didn't act great in that. But the fact that he's a wise ass and a rebel, that's indispensable, not only to the arc of the plot, but also to his appeal. So thank you. I agree. Time for one more? Or, or more? do you want me to give away the plot of? <laughs> OK, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.